we are very, very happy to have uh, Katia and David for a presentation. So Katia, uh, by most of you know Katia. So she's uh, an applied microeconomist. Uh, and uh, she, of course, her field of uh, study is uh, migration. So she has worked on a different set of issues, migration network, return migration, entrepreneurship. She was one of the first one to use experiment uh, in our field. So uh, I think that she had a paper with Pedro, uh, her husband, uh, 10 years ago. So uh, we are very happy to have uh, Katia. David will be also online and will answer questions in the chat and also uh, live. So Katia, uh, I'm going to give you the floor and you have 45 minutes uh, for your presentation. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Michelle, for the kind introduction and for the invitation. So it is a pleasure to be here today to tell you about this work that we have been working now for a little while on testing classic migration theories in the lab. So the motivation, um, well, for these audiences, is a very simple one. So it's this idea that if we were to take uh, the classical economic migration theories literally, we would be very surprised. I mean, given the income inequality we see in the world, we would expect everyone to be moving, or a lot of people at least, to be moving from the poor countries to the rich countries. And yet what we see is only these 3% um, of, the, uh, of the world's population at the migrants. Another question that we have is this one about why is it so if, I mean, if uh, we were to expect that people moving would be just in search of income gains, why is it that instead we see that migrants are typically positively selected? And here positively selected, meaning uh, that uh, we see typically those that have more education and uh, higher income uh, migrating, not necessarily the poorest, least educated. So these are facts that we are kind of familiar with, but these are facts that are puzzling in light of this classical theory. So this is the starting point. Now, it's not that we don't have theories uh, to explain uh, migration. So as, as you all know, so we have these classical cost-benefit theories starting with uh, Larry Shastad's work, where, I mean, the emphasis is on um, well, not necessarily only monetary costs, but monetized costs and benefits of migration. And so this is the classical theory uh, that I was alluding to in the motivation. But um, I mean, starting with the work of, of Borjas and, and others uh, afterwards. So we know that, I mean, we can take into account people's characteristics, namely their observable characteristics such as education and other skills that the econometrician cannot observe and that also play a role. And so here we would predict that those people that migrate depend on the characteristics they have. Then we have notably the, the Groger and Hansen work emphasizing the role of liquidity constraints, explaining that this is a reason why we don't see for the case of uh, migration from Mexico to the US, uh, why we see not negative selection, but um, interim uh, selection, okay? And, and then we have, we have other theories where uh, risk and uncertainty were emphasized, I mean, start, starting with arrows to arrow, and other factors such as imperfect information here. So we have the work by David and Kowatos, for example, emphasizing how imperfect information is when getting to potential migrants at the origin. And then we also took inspiration in terms of these various theories that we see out there of the work by Simone and Jesus on the importance of multiple destinations, when people are not just choosing between two destinations, but in, indeed they consider others and how this can change their decision. So in a way, we have a rich bundle of theories to explain migration, but it's kind of hard to know what's the contribution, what's the role for each of these theories, because yeah, empirically uh, separating these different factors, uh, which by, I mean, in addition, are not randomly distributed across patients and individuals, can be kind of complicated. So this is where we start. We start with this puzzle of, well, the classic theory does not say broad facts we observe on international migration on this rich set of theories that we cannot really separate so, uh, from each other in terms of predictive power. So this is the starting point that led us to think of testing these different theories and their contribution in using in an incentivized lab experiment. So this idea, uh, or the idea here, is how potential migrants trade off these different location attributes and then use this evidence to distinguish between 
between these competing theories that I just mentioned. So what we try to get at is on the one hand, doing step by step, I mean, starting with the classical Shastad Borges model, we start adding real world features and see how does this impact rates of migration and selectivity. So this is the first step and the one that I'll spend most time on here with you today. And then we'll also take test explicitly the um, independence of irrelevant alternatives assumption. So in the context of modeling these multi-destination choices, we one thing we do as a complement to the rest of the work is to document that there is a home bias effect that is people when faced with two identical alternatives in all respects except for a label of home they will display this average home bias effect uh, one thing that we learn in the course of our work will be that we find that people make migration decisions based on cost minimization rather than the income maximization that is, well, the theoretical framework we are most used to thinking about. So this is something that we learn and that we are currently exploiting. And finally, for those that are more linked to the behavioral economic side, we also have some preliminary evidence on which we are still working on uh, that these lab migration decisions correlate with actual migration, preparation and decisions. So this is our introduction. Okay, so in terms of related literature, we know that uh, there is a growing set of policy experiments, field experiments around migration, uh, surveyed by David in different pieces of work. We know, yeah, it's difficult to move people with, with these kind of experiments, but it's an interesting avenue uh, of uh, research. Now, it, it has only been more recently that people started applying lab experiments to the context of migration. So the first study that we saw was this one by Balas et al. that did some lab experiments, uh, not incentivized with the Slovak university students, where they found, I mean, they were also investigating how economic and non-economic factors were trading off in people's decisions to migrate. And they found also these important role for non-economic factors. More recently, there is uh, also uh, different pieces of work uh, now with incentivized lab experiments in different contexts. So we did some work in the Gambia, uh, Zach did some work with individuals in the US and in Ethiopia, like Akuzeral uh, studied a sample of people in Bangladesh. So in different contexts, uh, people have been, in, have been doing these incentivized lab experiments, all pointing in the direction of uh, imperfect information matters and other non-economic attributes, typically not in our standard models, they, they do have a role. Okay, so this is the recent literature in which we, uh, to which we, we contribute. Now, Okay, so now getting ready to, to start and show you the work we do, let's start with a very simple theoretical framework. Okay, so this is the typical uh, framework where our potential migrant is comparing the expected discounted utility of, uh, of moving from home, okay, here denoted with superscript H, to abroad maybe not to the superscript A. So here, utility in each of these locations depends not only on wages or the wage profile over the time period that is uh, referenced here, but also on local amenities. So this is the decision that people are facing. This is conditional, very importantly here for our purpose, this is conditional on a certain information set. Okay, And so this expected discounted utility gain from moving abroad is compared to a, a generic cost. And here, this generic cost can include things such, um, is a very generic cost that can include non-pecuniary costs, just from, I mean, things such as being away from your family and friends and, uh, and so on. Okay, now the, so for someone to decide that um, he or she will move to this abroad destination, there will also be, uh, they will also have to pay the initial cost. There is this income, uh, constraint here where we are not specifying where there are, I mean, this is just a liquidity constraint. We are not modeling credit constraints that might be in place or others. So this is a very simple way for us to summarize the decision, okay? The decision these people are making. Now, what we are going to do in the, the lab experiment will be to change each of these constraints, okay? So we will work with the differences in wages, as I'll specify in a moment, but then we'll also move the information set, we'll also change the liquidity constraint, and so we'll, we'll move each of these parameters here and see how people react in the lab. Okay, so here we also have these wage formation process, both for wages abroad and at home. Notice that 
the way with very plainly, very simply, is to have a basic wage that might, might differ abroad and at home, then they are returns to this observed skill. Okay, so typically we may think of education and this return to education can be different abroad and at home. In addition, we also allow for these different unobserved skills that can differ at home and abroad and that also have potential different returns in the two locations okay so this is the setting and now we'll translate this into our lab experiments okay and first uh, let me let me tell you the sample selection that we did so uh, we depart from the fact that the peak age of international migration is 22 to 24 years of age and that tertiary educated individuals are more likely to migrate. So with this broad stylized fact in mind, uh, we chose to work with tertiary educated undergraduate students that were in their final year of study. Okay, so these are uh, likely the ones that have the highest likelihoods of migrating in the future. Okay, so in a way, or we are selecting our sample in a way that makes it more likely to conform to these uh, well, to the new classical theories in the sense, these are more, more likely to move. Now, which are the sample of students that we are working with? So we chose two samples, one of 154 students from Nova in Portugal, who are mostly Portuguese and of, of which half has spent at least six months abroad. Then we have a second sample of 265 also final year undergraduate students in Nairobi from Strathmore University and the University of Nairobi, these are almost all Kenyan, and 12% of them have spent some, at least six months abroad. Let me say also that these students, they majored typically in economics, uh, management, and STEM. So again, I mean, kind of, kind of biased towards respecting these new classical theories, okay? So at, at least educated towards income maximization. And uh, no, just uh, a quick check to say that both samples were equally good at basic math. And uh, although the Nairobi sample was not so good at, expected, at calculating expected values. Okay. So how do we frame this decision to these experimental subjects? So we have this experimental subject that I just described. And the way we frame the experiment is to say something like this. So we are interested in learning how people make decisions between different places to work. Imagine that you have just accepted a job offer from a multinational company which has branches around the world. Your employer has told you that you need to accept a company transfer to a different country for a year. But it is offering you the choice between destinations. You should assume that everything else about the job and living conditions will be the same across destinations apart from the information the employer tells you. So, well, the way we are framing the experiment is such that we are trying to exclude many factors that could potentially affect this decision. First of all, we are not mentioning anywhere uh, the idea of a home country. So we are saying that there is this multinational company that has branches around the world, and now you will have to relocate to one of these locations and you have the ability to choose, okay? So um, it will be a different country, it will be for a year, okay? So as to set the time period. But you have the choice between destinations, you know? And crucially, everything that we do not tell you about when you have to make a decision will be the same across destinations. Okay, so now what destinations are our experimental subjects going to make? So they will make 28 decisions. So the way we structured these games was to uh, have three different blocks of nine games each, okay? So uh, in the first block, these experimental subjects will be choosing between two different destinations, okay? So they will have nine games, nine questions where they will make decisions between two destinations. Then we'll have a second block where they will have to make, again, nine decisions, play nine games, where they will choose between three different destinations. And then there will be a third block also with nine games, where they will have to choose between five different destinations. So here, what we have, so we have here in these three blocks, we'll have 27 decisions that will be made. And what we did was we, we randomized different blocks, guys. Right? Uh, and then we also randomized within each block the order of the different games, okay? So that order of the 
games does not matter. Then we also randomized the labeling of destinations. Uh, so the, the labeling and ordering of destinations. So whenever you are presented with a choice of two destinations, for example, you can have destination one first, destination two next, or the other way around. So that this ordering does not affect people's decision. We then have a final game that is meant to test this idea of home bias. Okay, so this idea that where people will have to choose between two destinations that are totally identical in all the characteristics that people are given, except for the fact that one of them will be labeled home. Okay, and so these are then the 28 incentivized choices that people might make. And well, incentivized here means that the experimental subjects, after they play all the games, they will receive a payout. Okay, and so in the instructions that we gave experimental subjects, we said something like, you should make each decision as seriously as you can, since at the end of the game, we'll randomly choose one of your choices, so that one of the choices made in, in the lab experiment to play for real money. Okay, and so we had this exchange rate of a thousand lab euros, translating into 10 real euros. Um, okay, it's for the Lisbon sample, so for, um, for the Kenyan, we added like two zeros and we made it in, in Kenyan shillings. So the way this worked was that at the end of the, of the game, one of these uh, 27 games was uh, randomly picked and this was implemented. And so the average, uh, the average payout for an experimental subject in Lisbon was uh, 17 euros, in Nairobi it was about 1600 Kenyan shillings. So this is, I mean, it's not high stakes, it's not like one month uh, of salary, but it is a reasonably high average payout. In this sense, it is meant to be an incentive for people to take it seriously, these choices that they are making. Okay, I don't know if anyone has questions. Yeah, there is a small question in the chat. What do you mean that the decision was implemented? Thank you for, for, for the question uh, and for phrasing it, Michelle. So here the idea is that we randomly pick one of the games and we looked at the choices that people make in the game and we pay them the equivalent payoff. Okay, so I'll show you the screens that people see the decisions they make and I think this will become clearer. Otherwise, please um, ask me again. Yes? I was just wondering about that time horizon of one year that appears pretty short, right? So most migration decisions are for a longer time horizon and require hence more planning. So what was the rationale behind that? And did you consider also a longer time horizon? Well, it, it is obviously a, a very good question. So here, yeah, this, this is the setting in which we are doing it. So we are trying to focus people on these. I mean, again, we are biasing the whole design of the experiment towards uh, people doing income maximization. Okay, But we are absolutely right that, I mean, if you were to look at different broader settings, we could try that. And we'll see, I mean, we'll discuss it. So maybe we'll leave some minutes at the end to discuss uh, different factors that could also play a role that are not here. I mean, we could obviously have, have played more games. The trade-off here is that, I mean, we think that for this kind of sample that is a high, uh, I mean, educated experimental subject, we can play 27 games. But more than these would lead to the responses not being informative. And so that's why we, we just, focus here. So again, the design is made so as to focus on settings in which we would expect people to be maximizing income. And as I'll show you, that's not exactly the case uh, many times. Sorry, I had an, another question related to the framing, because it's since you have wages and location, so implicitly you're setting people up to trade the, those off. So amenities of the location versus wage. But it's in that in the framing, in the setting you're putting themselves in, they're going to go one year, so that's related to the question I was asked before. But also, mm -hmm. they're just been hired by a multinational, so there's the sense that they'd also want to probably prove that they're flexible, that they can go, uh, you know, where basically wherever, even if it's far, and it, because it's one year, and that's a way to show, yeah, that they're. Good yeah, that's. I mean, yeah. that, that's. Uh, thank you for, for the question. That's obviously a very important uh, real world question. So here, the way we framed it to try and and uh, and avoid that. I mean, because what I think related to what you're saying is this idea of the home bias, right? So people could be more willing to go abroad. But here, what we did is we have them choosing between two locations that are. Uh, and let me go back. That is, so there are these different destinations, but none of them is labeled home. And so you are just choosing between two different destinations, okay? Not necessarily home. I'll show the results. Mm -hmm. when we but even between two destinations, 
they might they might give less of a weight to the amenities. So Lisbon versus Nairobi, I mean, I don't know. Yes, I guess. so what we do here to, to avoid that is yeah. that we tell them that anything that we don't tell you is the same, okay? Yeah. In the lab, we control for that. You are absolutely right that these kind of issues will pop up. But here, th this is the sense in which we are doing uh, quite, uh, I mean, a favorable test of this income maximization hypothesis. And as we'll see, it will not hold uh, oftentimes. Okay, so I'm already predicting <laughs> what we'll do next. Thank you. Okay, so what do we do behind the scenes? Okay, so our experimental subjects are not going to see most of what I'm going to show you now, but so that you understand exactly what we did and how we as econometricians are going to analyze this data, let me tell you what we did. So we randomly assigned characteristics to experimental subjects. For example, each of these experimental subjects will be assigned to a skill level, okay? So what we usually uh, talk about as, as an observable characteristic, okay? So the skill level could be one, two, or three, okay? And this is what we'll call the low skill, the intermediate skill, and the high skill. So this is assigned by us and not observable by the experimental subject. Then we will do the same, I mean, for the Borja's unobserved skills, okay? So these uh, that are different at home and abroad. And they will be drawn here from these three different values. So minus 200, zero to 100. And they might have different correlations as I'll, as I'll discuss next. Again, these characteristics are assigned by us, okay? The researchers, but they are not known by the experimental subject. We also assign each experimental subject with an endowment of wealth, okay? This will be important when we have, for example, liquidity constraints. And so here, each experimental subject might have 50 or 100 basis uh, endowment that is multiplied by their skill level. So the one that we drew here in the first bullet, uh, just to mimic the fact that more educated people tend to be wealthier. So the first two characteristics, skill level, uh, both observe and observe, will not be known to the experimental subjects. The experimental subject will know their endowment of wealth, even though they do not know where it is coming from. And then what they will observe will be these wage offers, okay? So they will know what's the wage they are going to be offered at destination one, the wage that will be offered at destination two, but they will not know this equation here, this wage formation process is not known to them. So what we do in the vaccines, okay, is that we'll know that, for example, here, destination one, this wage, is adds up a basic wage, a basic low wage of 500, but then adds up a relatively high return on skills, this 300, and then there is also a return on the unobservable characteristic, okay? So we draw these observable skills and observable skills, and then we compute the wage offer, and the wage offer is the only thing that our experimental subject will see, okay? We do the same for destination two. So here, I mean, here you have the typical trade-off in which the basic wage is higher, but the return to education is lower, okay? And so this will be the decision that someone would make, but they will just, the experimental subject again, is just seeing the wage offers and their endowment. So an example here is, uh, I mean, with this, this is the kind of screen that people were seeing. And so, I mean, as I mentioned before, so we have uh, this multinational corporation you work for is offering you a choice between destinations where you'll be working for a year. Okay? And so you have destination one that pays you a certain wage and it costs 5,000 shillings to move there. Then destination two, it pays a different wage and it costs zero to move there. And you have, and your endowment is this one, okay? Then the person presses continue after seeing this screen. And then it chooses between these two different options here where you have a summary of the endowment, the wage, the cost, and people make their decision, okay? So this is what our experimental subjects see. I had a question. Yes. Okay. So at, at the beginning, you started with like a long list of different theories about sort of migration. Can you help us? It, it seems like you're not going to be able to answer or like test all of those. Can you help us sort of figure out which, which ones you are t testing with this setup? Or which ones yeah, that's continue? exactly, exactly what, sorry for the long introduction. Okay, we are, we are hopefully getting there. So what we'll do is we'll have nine games. And each of them will be testing for the, the, I mean, will be observing, first of all, what's the impact that changing a certain real world aspect, I mean, checking how this change will affect people's decisions in the lab. Okay, so that's exactly what we are doing. So let me tell you what are the first three. Okay, so the first three are first, 
well, here using the same uh, wage formation process uh, that I just described. So this is the simple income maximization process. So this is the classical one against which we will uh, compare the decisions, okay? So people are just moving. So we set these and observable characteristics to zero and we just compare, what, I mean, we just check what people do, okay? And here the prediction would be very simple. Go where you make more money, right? Provided it is feasible and here everyone will be able to afford moving, okay? So what we would see, I mean, thinking that these skill, this S skill can, can take values one, two or three, what you see is that if the skill is one or two, it is worthwhile to move to destination two. But if it is uh, three, then, um, Sorry, it's the other way around, okay? So then it is better to just stay where you are, okay? So here, what you see is these black bars, where these black bars tell you that if you have skill one or skill two, you are better off migrating, okay? So the probability of migration for this very, very simple model should be 100%. Now, what I'm showing you here in the, with these blue and, and red bars is what people did in the lab, okay? And so what you see... Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, just a quick question. You claim before that you have a portion of your sample that has already been abroad, right? So yes. how much is that affecting the result or okay. that in terms of propensity or what to expect from migration? And, yeah. yeah. So I'll show some more results. But so whenever we check for real world characteristics of our sample, including this experience, they do not seem to significantly affect the decisions being made. Okay, so they do not seem important. So this applies here and this applies in other settings as I'll show you, but that does not seem to be important. So what we see here is that for sure, we see that in the lab, there is very high migration for the low skilled and almost known for the high skilled as the few would predict. Okay, so we have this pattern of negative self-selection. And again, the real world characteristics of the experimental subject do not seem to affect this. Now, one thing that we observe here when we compare the blue bars and the red bars is that there seems to be a great deal of experimental subjects in the Nairobi sample that are not income maximizing, okay? And so this was the first question that we got immediately in this very simple first game, okay? So in this sample, 31% are not income maximizing, okay? And so the hypothesis we put forward was this idea of cost aversion. So, they, I mean, we had some qualitative uh, evidence um, so uh, the, uh, collected after the, the games that pointed towards this. I mean, and here we have this quote saying that, well, as I'm a student, you make sure you avoid costs. You don't know where, what can come from them. And so we, we try to look at the evidence, okay, looking at the games and looking at specifically at those people. In this game one, we had 84 individuals that were not maximizing income. And what we saw is that 75% of those assigned the low skill levels, they did not income maximize because they were avoiding or they were avoiding higher wage destinations that involved a moving cost, okay? Whereas only nine were, I mean, were incurring the cost and going to a lower income destination. So this is indicative- uh, Katia, can I um, yes. just interrupt? Because there's two Please. questions that are both asking for a clarification here of what migrating means in this context. And so just, you know, we've got these destination choices of one or two. And so um, unbeknown, although we haven't told them that that one is not migrating, the one with zero migration costs is no migration. That's why there's no cost. And so we've set this up as, you know, in this uh, equation here, uh, you know, destination one here is your low income country with uh, high returns to skill, your typical developing country, and then migration would be moved to two. Okay, and so if you choose not to pay the migration costs, we call that not migrating. And then if you're, you are choosing to move to, to that, you are migrating. But here, you know, we're not putting the labels on of migration. We're not you know, telling them you're moving away from home. We're just varying the, the characteristics of destinations. And so, um, but, but you know, sorry, we didn't make that clear. Well, I'm sorry. I was I was jumping to the slide and trying to get there to get to I mean to the question, but that's obviously very important. Okay, so okay, thanks, David, for the clarification. Yeah, I don't know if there are any other clarification questions. So, okay, so this was the first game. In the first game, we expected most people uh, to migrate, and we see that well, some are not migrating, and some seem to be uh, minimizing costs, costs as opposed to just income maximization. Can, can I can I just make sure I understand the result? 
this is saying that you told some people that option A is 10 and option B like will give you 15 but costs three and people people chose option A. Is that the result? Like some people, not everybody chose, not everybody decided that 15 minus three was better than 10. Is that the result? Is that what- Precisely right, yes. Okay. okay, that's the exact point. And again, I should say that we would expect that these experimental subjects that are that are young, that have been educated in, in econ, uh, management, STEM, so that they would conform to this income maximization theory. And yet we are seeing that even in this simple setting, we are already seeing some people doing differently or performing differently. Now we will add real world features and try to see what happens as a result, okay? So the first thing we do then is to consider these other skills, so to consider an observed skill. So, I mean, this is in line with these, I mean, the Borges model where your and observed skills might change your pattern at selection, okay? And so that's exactly what we see here. What we see and comparing the different games so that you see the effect is that People, they tend to be, when, we, when you compare game one to game two and three, which is not very different, what you see is that people tend to be migrating less, okay? So the pattern of selection is not dramatically different, but what you see is that migration is reduced. And by the way, so game three is the special case of the political refugee sorting, which is one where, I mean, so just think of a political activist that is not very much appreciated in his home country, but if he moves to a different country, then the return to his an observable skill is now positive. So there is a negative correlation here between, between people's and observed characteristics. But what we see here is that th that doesn't really make a lot of difference in terms of people's decisions to migrate. Okay, and so let me move on and show you the other games. So in this Three more games. The fourth game adds liquidity constraints. Okay, so some people now will not be able to afford to move, okay, even if they have a higher wage that they would like to benefit from. Then the fifth and sixth games will introduce uncertainty. So there will be in the fifth game, there is a set risk of unemployment, 30%. There will also be an unemployment insurance of 200. Note that unemployment insurance, I mean, can have different meanings. Okay, so this can be a social state that pays you uh, an amount of cash, but it could also be your network that provides support at destination when you move and don't get the job. Then the sixth game basically tries to get at endogenous unemployment. So unemployment in this round uh, will depend on how many people decide uh, to, to migrate. Okay, so there's a fixed set of uh, vacancies and depending on the people that move, you can have more or less unemployment. Okay, to make it um, quick, but hopefully clear. So what do we see? First, just when we introduce liquidity constraints. When we introduce liquidity constraints, what you see is that, well, people are, I mean, the pattern of selection definitely changes. And remember that what we did was that the endowment that people have uh, to cover this cost of migration was lower for people with, uh, with lower skills. Okay, so this pattern of more intermediate selection has to do with exactly that. So what we see here is people with lower skills, they won't be able to afford moving and so this, and hence this lower propension to migrate. Okay, so, and overall, we also see that there is lower migration. If people cannot afford to move, you have a lower migration overall. Then uncertainty, okay? So this risk of unemployment. So what do we see here? when we introduce unemployment in either way, what we call exogenous unemployment, a set rate of unemployment, or a rate of unemployment that depends on the decisions of other experimental subjects. And so here, what we see is, again, that people are migrating less. So here, there are no liquidity constraints. So we do not see that intermediate selection pattern. What we see is that migration lowers as a result of unemployment, okay? And so what we see is, I mean, and maybe that's the question that you could be asked, is does this have to do with risk aversion? So we measured risk aversion through different ways. And we see that, well, in the first game, when migration, when an uncertainty or the, the unemployment rate is known, we have that, well, and risk aversion seems to matter in the Lisbon sample, not so much when the unemployment rate is endogenous, but it doesn't really work that well in the Nairobi sample. Okay, so some role, but not... Uh, I mean, not really explaining it all. I don't know if this was too fast or I keep on moving. 
Okay, so then let's look at this. So what we are doing now is we are sequentially adding more real world features. And so what we did in round seven was to combine this idea of, uh, or to introduce this idea of incomplete information. So here, you don't know for sure what risk of unemployment, okay? It is randomly drawn from uh, this set where it can take values 10%, 30%, or 50%. The same thing uh, for unemployment insurance, which could be now 100, 200, or 300. Now, the feature here, or an important fact here, is that people could pay to know the exact probability. So people can pay to acquire information, okay? Something that mimics the way migration decisions can be made. You can, I mean, make some, incur in some costs to try and have better information. So this is round seven. And then in round eight and nine, we are trying to keep adding real world characteristics such as liquidity constraint. In game eight, we have also incomplete information. That is, you can pay uh, to acquire information, but sometimes you won't be able to afford it. I mean, say you have to take a flight to go your destination, learn about it, but you cannot afford to do it. So that will not really be a possibility. And finally, game nine will have the endogenous unemployment and here also with liquidity constraints. So let me show you maybe, okay, so just to show you this screen. So what happens if you have insufficient funds is that this destination will be available. Okay, but let me show you now, I want to show you maybe this, this picture, okay, which I think is, uh, is what clarifies a bit and, and allows us to compare a bit the kind of results that we have. So notice that so when we started, Game one, we were expecting everyone in skills one and two to migrate, okay? no, no one in skill three. So, I mean, even though in the lab people were not doing exactly that, we see that we have high levels of migration and negative selection, okay? So, and this is the prediction of these income maximization models. Now, as we add real world features such as liquidity constraints or uncertainty, imperfect information, what we end up having is much lower migration rates overall. So we, first of all, we decrease a lot the overall level of migration. And so this goes toward our initial stylized fact, which was why do we only see 3% of people in the world moving when there's so many, I mean, such a huge income gap to be ripped, right, in the, in the world's income distribution. So that kind of, I mean, yeah, we, and, and many things are absent here. I mean, as you mentioned before, this is a highly stylized lab experiment where we're trying to capture the main features of these uh, that might affect these decisions. And yet we can go from a 97% migration rate to a 10% one. And there are no migration barriers, legal barriers at all. So migration is totally free in this experiment. And the other thing is the selection pattern that goes from being uh, very negative to being more positively Select. Okay, so that's these realistic features. So let me just highlight maybe so here we, we do some exercise predicting or looking at what are the characteristics, uh, what are the theories that predict this level and skill of migration. So let me just say that liquidity constraints and risk do reduce migration, make it less negatively selective. Okay, so these have an important role both in the Lisbon and the Nairobi sample. Then here, so I mean. The incomplete information is not very well captured in this regression because people can pay to acquire this information, okay? And then, as Anna was asking before, so real-world characteristics, they do not seem to affect people's decisions in this experiment. Okay, now, one important uh, motivation that I showed you at the beginning was this idea that adding more destinations can break down this uh, hypothesis of the independence of irrelevant alternatives, okay? So in other words, uh, we know that having uh, more than two destinations can complicate the decision. So we do this, we test this specifically in our setting, okay? Which is in line with uh, the work of, of Simone and Jesus. And so, I mean, and here the idea would be that if people invert their initial choice uh, between destinations two and one, it's because this hypothesis this is not really holding. And so we uh, I'll skip some of these, but we find exactly that for a substantial portion of our sample, these, uh, this happens, okay? So irrelevant choices will matter and will change people's initial decisions. Uh, sorry, I'm going to skip all of these. Okay, we also document, as I mentioned before, uh, this home bias effect. So in this case, people were shown with two totally identical destinations in terms of cost of moving, uh, wages, 
and just we attach a home label to one of these destinations and we found that indeed people in both the Lisbon and the Nairobi sample were more likely to choose home. Okay, so this is our evidence to document this home bias effect. Uh, Katia, about this home bias, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, in, in line with what David said, what would you get if you would give the same uh, net wage to these respondents, but with a home bias, with, with a home destination with a cost of moving equal to zero and a positive cost for the foreign destination, rather than relabeling the home destination as, uh, as home. So basically you wouldn't label, but you would play with uh, the, the net wage. Do you see what I mean? Um... Yes, so I think, I mean, if, uh, so what I, I would, well, positivity I would apply, but uh, but we know that, I mean, sometimes we are surprised when we do these lab experiments, but I would say that if people, when they have these, I mean, when, when they are faced with these two identical decision destinations, they choose the home. So if, the, I mean, if you were to add a net benefit in addition to that, I guess they, they would still do the same, but this would be another round, okay? And another question I think, uh, that could happen here or another it would be that we could have added this label to which of the 27 rounds that we played. And it would be interesting also to compare. But again, we could not do this all at once. But there are many related issues that could be interesting to explore. Maybe a, a final note here to say that, um, well, um, often uh, people worry that, I mean, the question is how well does this game or lab behavior predict real life migration actions, okay? And so we are doing some exercises. So here we have some simple evidence from this follow-up survey that we did with the Lisbon sample, where we found that those that had, so looking specifically at the home bias, okay, in the game, we found that this was significantly associated with fewer migration actions, okay? People, specifically, they were uh, looking less for work abroad and they were less likely to be abroad, okay? Although the sample is, is small, but there is some correlation here that goes in line with the game behavior being well correlated with real life migration actions, okay? So just to conclude, so the main findings we have here are that adding real world features, okay, which take into account liquidity constraints, risk, uncertainty, incomplete information uh, to the income maximization suggested at the Borges model seems to make a huge difference in terms of predicting both the rate of migration and also the selection patterns. Then uh, I didn't show you too much on these, but these assumption, the independence from irrelevant alternatives, which underlies many models of multi-destination migration choices, well, it um, only holds well for simple migration decisions. So what we found was that when we added more real world features, this uh, assumption was more likely to break down. Okay? And specifically when the risk of unemployment and incomplete information were added, this assumption would no longer hold for 20% of people in our game, which is a substantial fraction. And I mentioned that uh, there seems to be a home bias. Okay, so we just document it very simply. And then with these, we have this uh, clue here that we want to exploit more. That is that at least for some of the experimental subjects in our sample, cost minimization seems to be a key decision factor in migration decisions and uh, not only the income maximization. Okay, so I'll leave it at this. I don't know if we can have uh, further discussion. Thank you very much, Katia. So we can uh, open the floor for uh, questions. So yeah, please, Mr. Ben, who wanted to ask one, then I had mine. Yes, please yeah, go I ahead. I have a question too. Yes, Simone, go ahead. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask my, my question. It's, it's a minor question, Katia. How do you adjust framing once you introduce unemployment, given that the, the, the initial setup is you have been hired by a multinational and you need to choose the destination. Yeah, it's that it, you arrive there and, and the job is no longer available for you to take. So you have to just benefit from what we call the unemployment insurance. Okay, and the, the unemployment insurance, as I mentioned, it, it can be understood in different ways depending on the setting, but that's you arrive there. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the position is no longer available. Got it. So for that one year, you'll just have the unemployment insurance instead of the wage you were expecting. Got it. In case I'm speaking for Joanne, who's somewhere in the audience, but not in the panelists. But I wanted to push back a bit on this, on the IIA assumption and the way you model, you know, multiple, the choice between multiple destinations. Right. Because one of those destinations is home. So I understand you don't label it as home, 
but one of those destinations is a zero cost destination, which some people would just understand as, as, as home. So there's a sense in which, so that's why I'm, I'm referring to Joanne's work because uh, you know, there's a modeling of the migration decision that's two nests, one being whether you migrate or not, you stay home or you leave. And then within the nest where you live, you're choosing between destinations, but we maybe you refer to, you know, more older versions of maybe more you know, simpler models, but I think this type mm -hmm. of models would not typically, the one I described, would not typically assume IIA if one of the options is home. That's that's really interesting, and I mean, but I guess we would have to run another lab, and maybe that's that's an idea to test exactly that. I think that's that's very interesting, and that's something that could be. I mean, that could be done. Yeah, that's not exactly what we have here. I understand. I understand your point, and I think the best way to address that would be I mean, to design an experiment in which you could run the two things and see how how people um, reacted differently in the two settings. I guess. Okay, thank you. thank you. Before I, uh, I give the floor to Ashish, I would like to, to ask a question in line with uh, the question of Clement. So basically, you, you can have deviation from IIA for uh, two different reasons, basically. Be basically, you have this own bias, and basically also because between sets of foreign destination, you will have subsets of destination that are more similar, you know, uh, in an observable. So in, in your setup, if you find a home bias, does it not uh, imply automatically that you should have a rejection of uh, the IIA hypothesis? So can, you link so, the, can, can you link the two? So the way we did this was we, we have these final rounds where we label two identical locations and one of them is labeled home. So we do not test, and this is what, what I meant when I was saying that we do this very simple documentation of home bias just with these identical locations and one is labeled home and people prefer that more than by chance. So the proper way to do what you're suggesting, Michelle, would be again to run all of these games, uh, the label, and then we could document that. I mean, the interaction between the home bias and these irrelevance of alternative um, um, so, so, and this hypothesis, will, I mean, we cannot say that just with the game we have. So we would have to do this interaction to do it. But of course, I mean, when you do this lab, you have to take into account that, I mean, for people to reveal their, I mean, meaningful behavior, you have to shorten the number of games. So we would have to select what's really important and do that comparison. We could not do this in, in this setting. But I agree uh, that, that um, yeah, that would be something interesting to exploit. Okay. Can I just uh, uh, chime in on, on one, one thing on this IIA? So thanks for these, these comments about the sort of way of potentially modeling it with, you know, these nests and things. I guess, you know, the, the main thing that comes out of this is that what kills IIA is adding uncertainty and imperfect information. Because once you, you have to start putting in decisions of whether to invest in information acquisition about these new alternatives that come in, then it starts messing around with your decisions. So even if you'd made it this two step, and we have this because we can look at decisions in, in three destination games versus five destination games. So even if we were to take out that home option, it's still the case that um, because you know when you add more destinations, and there's uncertainty and incomplete information, your decision of sort of how much to invest in finding out about one destination starts getting affected by another. And so, you know, I think IIA is gonna break down in that, uh, e even if you had that that sort of case too. So it's it's really the uncertainty and the incomplete information mm -hmm. that, that causes the big breakdowns in IIA. Okay, so we have a, a set of uh, uh, questions. So uh, Ashish, Jesus, Michael, and Giuseppe. So Ashish, you are the first in line. So please go ahead. I'm wondering if you ask people what they thought about the game after they played, because you gave them this really stylized setting and then told them not to infer anything beyond the information you're telling them. But that's, I imagine that's hard for people. And so, you know, in particular, there are like a couple of things, like I would imagine seeing a zero cost destination, I, would, I could infer that that's probably closer to home. And so maybe I'll like the amenities better or something like that. And similarly with the IIA test in the, the information uncertainty environment, at, like giving information about a new destination that's strictly worse might make me update my belief about like 
how good the opportunity is relative to, to sort of this uncertain environment or something like that. And so I'm just wondering if you asked people if they thought about stuff like that or if, if they really interpreted the game exactly as you told them to. That's an excellent question. So I don't know, David, if you remember. So the, the thing that we noticed from these, I mean, from the questions we asked afterwards was these uh, were really focused on understanding why people were not in maximizing. For th these points that you are raising, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, but l let me just say that, so the way we framed it, and of course, they're always, I mean, it would be interesting to know if people really bought the framing that we were giving them, was that you should take everything else in this niche as the same, okay? So namely the amenity. But it's, it's a fair question to ask, and I don't remember that we have this qualitative information to complement what we have. But, well, the framing should take it away, but uh, yeah, it, it would be nice to have more of this. We can maybe check from the qualitative work we did afterwards if there is anything to support this. Thank you. Jesus, please. Yes, uh, thanks. A very, uh, very nice presentation, Katia. So, uh, so I have a, a comment about IIA. So the, uh, depending on the type of uncertainty that you have, I mean, I, I would say that in the first uh, uncertainty game that you give them, where you give them the exact probabilities and so on, theoretically, we should expect IIA to hold. I'm not so sure about the following game, the game in which they, 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 they where, it, where, uh, where it is endogenous, okay? So <laughs> I wanted to say that I missed the, the black bars in, in some of the specifications that yeah. you showed us, because that was very <laughs> helpful for the first one. And then in theory, I would not expect a IIA to hold with incomplete information. So that, that's, that's, a, a, that's, that's exactly. an environment. So that's, that's an environment where we know actually that uh, IIA should or does not need to hold. Uh, then the question I wanted to ask you is a little bit based on the previous uh, question that you got. It's about the cost minimization. So, so for these people for which you observe no income maximization, so you actually looked at how many of them were cost minimizing because I, that. I remember the anecdote, but I don't know if you did something serious. So how do they exactly minimize costs? Just by looking at the moving costs and that's it? Or, or is there something yes. else? Okay, so thank you so much for this, for all of the comments. So, I mean, you knew it already, right? So the results we get are exactly what you were saying regarding the breaking down of IIA. Okay, so it's exactly when yeah, there is more uncertainty, there is imperfect information that it tends to break down more. So that's exactly what you're saying. That's what we obtain. Now, regarding the cost minimization, so what we did so far was just look, I mean, or the way we saw, we looked at it was that people tend to not move when they have to incur in costs. And so they end up uh, say, well, it's not staying home because it's not labeled home, but they end up not migrating because there is a cost associated. So whenever we see people not migrating, it tends to be because there is a cost associated with the move. So the, what's the comparison? The comparison we make here is we look at, uh, so for the simplest case, for the people with the higher skill, for them, not cost maximizing is moving, okay? And few do this. And few do this uh, because, uh, and, and that would also uh, have, uh, this would be not income maximizing and incurring the costs. So looking at this, the probability that you don't income maximize because of a cost happens more to these low skilled guys. I don't know if this is, I mean, yeah. Michael, you had a question? Thank you so much. Just some brief and superficial comments. It's just a, an absolutely fascinating idea to pool together all of these theories and in one dispositive experiment test between them. I guess the aspect of experimental design that, that made me wonder the most was the idea that, that the return to unobserved, well, I guess the, the level of unobserved skill is unobserved to the experimental subject. I, I, I paused a little bit at that, uh, wondering how if that weren't true, that I, I know how, how smart or energetic I am relative to other people, or maybe in the most obvious case, I know my my uh, my ethnicity, whether I'm a Tigrayan or a Romo in, in, in Ethiopia, what caste I am in India, maybe most obviously my race in South Africa vastly affects in it, mincer aggression, what, uh, what the return home versus abroad are, how, how deciding based on my known uh, un, uh, hey, unobserved Michael, can to I the just, economist type. Go ahead. My, um, I just jump in to clarify one, one thing yes. there. So when we say that they, they're not we don't tell you, hey, Michael, you're high skill education, but actually low skill unobserved ability. Um, so we don't tell you your S and your E, but we tell you your wage, which captures all you need to know about your S and your E. And so from the point of view of making your decisions, you know everything you need to know. We're just not, we're just trying to stop you having to make calculations. We're not going to say, here's the wage equation, here's your skill, here's your E, you know, then you can calculate and you can see what the returns to these things are. We're just saying, you know, 
your wage offer is this and that wage offer perfectly reflects your race or your ethnicity or whatever. So, so it is observed to you from the point of view of what matters for decisions. We're just not telling you explicitly, we have assigned you skill level S um, equals one and skill level E equals minus 200. Thank you, then that was just my confusion. Uh, well, the, the the other superficial reaction was uh, when when you said you could get from ninety I guess seven percent migration to ten percent without migration barriers. I mean, this comment won't surprise you coming from me, but you know when Chikara and Hansen are putting that cost in the decision equ equation, that that also represents uh, migration barriers, and and certainly uh, uh, sure. the, the the costs that you're telling these people and and the uncertainty of earnings uh, that that you're telling these people could be costs or uncertainty that are generated by migration barriers. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't interpret the result as giving you an, an effect in the absence of migration barriers. I don't think that's possible to separate from the concept of costs and uncertainty as introduced in the experiment. Yeah, this is just in the lab. Okay, we are excluding from those considerations. Again, this is the same question that asked Shish, is, I mean, how much buy-in do these experimental subjects make of our framing. Our framing should exclude this, even though that's very important in the real world, that will, I mean, where the effect of uncertainty, liquidity constraints, etc., will be much larger than in the lab. But so the whole experiment here is done in a way that, that is, again, it's biased towards income maximization. And so that's why it is so striking for us to see that even in this very biased setting, we still see it breaking down. So, I mean, basically what, what we think is that this gives us clues on there are probably other important mechanisms in making your decision to migrate that are not just to do with income maximization. I don't know. If, uh, 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 absolutely. I'm just talking about the interpretation with regard to policy yeah, barriers. Absolutely. I mean, when you tell a person, fine. here's the it's cost, the that, that is sure. the kind of thing that a person yeah. would consider as visa application fees or the results of a visa lottery and, uh, and the uncertainty. Are, are, are not, uh, I, I wouldn't conclude that we have established the relative role of migration barriers from the, <laughs> from these really, really striking results. Thank you. A very last question from Jose. Yeah, very, very quick question. Uh, you introduced the risk of uh, losing your job. So you have introduced the possibility of getting unemployment benefits, etc. I was wondering uh, why didn't you include, or if it's possible, it would be possible to include the probability of raising your wage. So to to have a sort of positive attitude to, towards going abroad. I had this idea because basically you are, you are dealing with out-migration, our immigration, and you had Portuguese students there, if I understand mm -hmm. well. So having the possibility of, or, or at least you don't have in your game, the fact that uh, these people may increase their earnings when they are going abroad, especially for the skill level three, this may be important and they may, this may be important in getting your conclusion, getting your results in terms of cost minimization and not uh, income uh, maximization in some way. So, thank you for that. So let me just see if, if I understood it correctly. So what I'm talking about is that uh, people, so after moving, they might increase their wage, right? So something more uh, in a dynamic sense, is that what you mean? Exactly, in the dynamic sense. The fact that they don't have, say, a, a sort of return to skills. They don't know the return mm -hmm. to skill, as, as David said, they know just yes. the wage, but they don't know whether the wage tomorrow is going to be higher or not than today. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and I mean, your experiment is just for one year. So that's the point, I you think, could yes. see, But then also the risk of unemployment may be uh, not that important in that one year period in some way. So, I was wondering whether not including, say, the upward effect of migration, the possibility of increasing your status and increasing your wage later on, not immediately when you get there, whether your, your I, wage I can, so, can increase over time rather than staying there or having the risk of losing your job. Yeah, so what you're saying is that the assimilation gap should decrease over time. And so this dynamic effect where, especially for the skill, they will catch up faster. It's absent. I mean, it's, a, it's a, a very valid comment. I guess this is, is related to the comment that Ben made earlier on, I mean, dynamics may be, uh, may be important here, can interact with skills and selection. And so that's totally right. Again, this was, we tried to isolate a few important factors, but yeah, uh, we are missing this point and it is an important point. So thank you very much for that. We might, uh, yeah, we, we can try to think a bit more about it, but in this setting, I don't think we can say much about it. It's, I mean, again, so I think one thing that comes out of this work is that 
a lot of lab experiments can be made to test different aspects. Okay, so what Clement was saying, what, what you were all suggesting, as she says, well, so yeah, we can test many different dimensions using this kind of method, I think. So for this, we have a very simple first, let's put it, objective of looking at these income optimization hypotheses, but a lot of things I think could be studied using this same kind of experiment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katia and David, for uh, this great presentation and uh, answering all the questions. So thank you very much. Uh, I think that it's...